Okay, so we are here at the National Museum of Computing and we are with Tony Jarvis, one of the trustees here and a member of the uh, BOM team. Tony, thank you, thank you for taking the time out to, uh, to okay. speak to us today. Um, so, Tony, we, we know uh, a fair bit about the BOM. Uh, we can see one right behind you and the way it was used in the war uh, to, to help uh, code breakers. Um, tell me a little bit about, um, about East Coat and uh, the operation that was taking place down there just north of London. Well, Eastcote was the, the biggest outstation out of five. Uh, we think there were about, about 80 bombs at Eastcote. Uh, the other ones were much, or well, there were three small ones and two larger ones later in the war, Eastcote and Stanmore, just north of London. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was staffed by, by Wrens? That yeah, was the, the Wrens were chosen uh, to staff, to run all the bombs. Yeah. Uh, uh, sort of basically eight Wrens per bomb. Uh, there were two on each of three shifts and two resting. So they always worked on the same bomb, they got used to their own machine. And what was it like working down there? Uh, well, they did call it the hell hole because the environment wasn't very good at all. Uh, they were closed in, uh, the windows were very small and didn't open very far because of the bomb blast walls outside. So there was not much fresh air, not much daylight. Uh, during the winter, of course, there were coke stoves chucking out fumes uh, and it wasn't a very nice environment at all. But uh, these young ladies were quite young, most of them. There were older ones, but mostly they were teenagers and um, they loved to live it up. Although they worked very hard during their eight hour shift, as soon as they finished, they put their glad rags on across the road to the station, down to London to live it up. <laughs> they really played hard as well as working yeah. hard. And obviously the, uh, the location itself had a massive impact on the war. Absolutely, yeah. yes. In conjunction with, with here at Bletchley, but the other satellite locations as well. Yes. And it finally got decommissioned uh, late in the 50s, is that correct? Yeah, some of the bombs were actually kept after World War II because we know that some of the Eastern Bloc countries were still using Enigma and didn't know that Bletchley Park was able to decode the messages. So they were working right up until the late 50s. But we assume then that uh, uh, the rest of the bombs were decommissioned. The parts were still very scarce uh, and they assumed they weren't needed anymore. So they were taken apart and the parts used for other things. Okay. Tony, thank you very much for your time. You're really welcome. appreciate it. And you're doing a fantastic job here and uh, please keep it up. We love it. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So you heard it from Tony. The impact of the bomb was huge and the impact that East Coat had on the war was significant too. We can now go to our roving reporter, Cyberclive, live at East Coat Place. Just stay in there. Hello, it's me, Cyber Clive, here in the bowels of my London home, Eastcote Place. Now, Eastcote Place is very, very mysterious. During the war, that is the real one, the second world one, it was used as a communications headquarters by the government. And in this very room, Winston Churchill, he's the fat one, had a meeting with Eisenhower, he's the bald one. And the secrets that they kept, all to do with enigma and breaking codes, were inside these rather hefty safes, where now, as you can see, we keep uh, uh, a few, few paintings that we we don't tell the tax man about. Shh. So, today we're going to be discussing the topic of RFID, radio frequency identification. Come with me and let's meet a man who knows a thing or two about that. Just before we move on to meet my special mystery guest, I thought I'd remind you of what this whole event's about. 
Cyber House Party is to raise money for two very good causes, NSPCC Childline and Mind. So raising money for children who need our help and people with mental health problems, of which there'll be many during this difficult time of Corona. Now you can just go to the Cyber House Party Just Giving page and give generously to help these people that need us. So with no further ado, let us move on in our mysterious bunker. And now, to meet my special mystery guest, why, it's Quentin Taylor. Ah, oh, hello Quentin. Hello Cyber Clive. Well, we're here to talk about RFID. Shall I pull up a chair? So, isn't this nice? Screw top. So what I'm going to do is have a little chat with my friend Quentin about RFID. Oh, well, I'm tired of that. There you go. Oh, do have a glass of the old 64. So, thank you. Radio frequency identification. Yes. That's what RFID stands for. Certainly does, yes. Now let me explain a little more to the boys and girls at home about what that really means. So you see, radio frequency identification is all about how you can identify a person by the frequency with which they listen to a particular radio station. Are you with me so far? Well, let me explain a little further. I listen to Radio 4 every day. This means I'm middle class, educated, affluent, charming, good looking, probably reads the telegraph. Whereas somebody who listens to say Radio 3, they're be older than me because they too are quite middle class and affluent, but they're too old to remember the lyrics to any of the songs. So to make sure it doesn't annoy them, they listen to the kind of music that doesn't have lyrics. Radio 3. Then you've got, say, a Radio 2 person. They probably read the Daily Mail. Not really to be trusted, rather ordinary table wine. And of course, there's a Radio 1 listener. This will be a youth, probably somebody in jeans a troublemaker on corners. That's your cyber hacker. That's your criminal. And so by using a little bit of data about what you listen to, well, if it's LBC, it probably means you're totally criminal and a bit nuts. Then by, by knowing that one piece of data, the radio station someone listens to, we can identify the kind of person they are and then put them into a position of trust according to who and which group they fall into. Isn't that right, Quentin? Not entirely, Clive. Oh, really? I, I'm, I'm, I don't disagree with your, your definitions of the people who listen to the radio, various radio stations, but yeah. actually, in fact, radio frequency ID is, is different to that. It's about, uh, well, commonly, it's about identifying things via radio and being able yeah. to interact. Yeah. So typically, it would be around some kind of tag or item and the antenna that would uh, um, it would pick up electromagnetic radiation and then it would like power itself so they're powered magically over the airwaves you like that what are you talking about Quentin well are these little cards that get powered let me show you a card very quickly oh and like a magic trick so this is a card I know you'd like this one this is the winery hotel so this would be ah. the exactly cheers cheers very nice place in Sweden I believe uh, and that little card there, you can hold that. Oh, right, OK, I have to remember it. Yeah. There's an antenna in there. No, no, you don't remember it. OK, so I'm not going to put it back into a deck. And oh, okay. I'm not that kind of person. Um, it's not that magic. It's, it's going to pick up radio frequencies, a certain radio frequency, and then it's going to actually send back a signal based upon the electricity that goes into there. OK. And then that's going to identify this card to a reader. Like a radio four person. No, I mean, I mean more like when you go into a hotel room. You know, when you go to a hotel room, and mm. I know you do stay at hotels on occasion, and no. I know some of them give you keys, but some of the more modern ones give you these little magic cards. They do. They do. This is one of those magic cards. And that's got what to do with RFID? Well, that's an RFID card. So that allows you to identify yourself to a hotel door and let yourself into the right room, not the wrong room like last time. 
Yeah, but that was pre-corona, folks, and anything could have happened then. So what else has got the RDIF in it? Well, various other devices have got it in there. So you might have uh, children's toys could have uh, an RFID chip in them. In the bottom, this is from a, a popular uh, game, uh, whichever one this is. And when you put that on the computer, uh, this particular character would appear in the game for you. And the little and the receiver is in the bottom. And there's an FFID thingy in there. There's an RFID chip in the bottom of this. Right. Well, okay, I can demonstrate it to you. Imagine. That's a lock. So that's a lock there, okay? Can you mm, see? Yeah. And that's another kind of card. This is an Ikea okay. one. And when I put the card near it... It's gone down. It goes down, and when it goes up... It's gone up again. So that would allow oh, you to lock Do that again, door. do that again, do that again. It's gone down. <laughs> it's gone up again. So that would allow you to lock a door. Uh, but, Clive, can you see that card you've got? Yeah, a hotel, a winery, so, and an experience. So I can actually take that card, Okay. and I can make that card also do it. Even though they're different hotels. Even though, well, they're different places. This is just a cheap IKEA lock. Uh, and what I've done there is I've made this card work on this particular lock. Could you make one for me so I could get into hotel rooms? Well, if that it was... That weren't necessarily mine. In theory, yes. Yeah, yes, I mean, yes. I mean, I practice maybe as well. And then it allows you, for example, to copy other things. So, like, if I do this little device here... Come on, you. I can then use this little device to copy that card. So now I've got... That's like a little key ring thing. That's a little key ring thing, and that can copy eight cards, and it can copy them on the fly. So this really is what I could take to the Marriott and get in? Well, yes, if you could get to within uh, a few centimetres of somebody's card, if they left their key card oh, on I the bar... Oh, I could do that. Uh, you could copy their card yeah. and then you could get in. Now, the important point to note here is this isn't a specific security vulnerability. This is more of a feature. But people don't understand that this is how these cards work. And they've got to understand, when you talk about locks, you've got all different kinds of locks on doors, good ones and bad ones. And you've got to work out what are you trying to protect and what kind of lock and how it should be configured. And radio frequency ID cards, they can be configured very badly, like this cheap IKEA lock is configured, or they can be configured very not so badly. Your I can get into card, his car as well. This is great. Your credit card, pretty much, if it has that little symbol on there, where you can be contactless, yeah. that's using radio frequency ID as well. I could do that to him, right? This is great. They're normally an awful lot better quality than a £20 IKEA lock, though, to be fair. Other locks are available. Exactly. So, what we've learned here is that there are good locks and there are bad locks. Let's stick with the good locks, people. Yeah. And that if you listen to Radio 4, you're a better kind of person than, than the others. And that was really useful. And we'll work on that little idea I've got for my friend later. So, don't forget that today is all about Cyber House Party and raising money for NSPCC Childline and Mind. So, if you go to the Just Giving page, that's clicking up all night, and just give generously if you can, give wherever you possibly can, everything helps, but the more the better towards these two very good causes of children and mental health. And with that, I think it's time probably to, uh, to thank Quentin uh, very much for all that he did, and to just bring his yeah, little handies round here again, and then we just pop this back on there. Thank you. No, it's okay. Don't worry. It's not going to hurt. And, uh, well, I, uh, I think that went very well, don't you? Uh, cheerio, folks, and don't forget, give generously to Cyber House Party on the Just Giving page for Childline and for Mind. Thanks. Do you want me to leave the door open? In case you're scared of the dark. Mm, Come in, Mother.